Uh, so it's time for our program and our, our, uh, our speaker. Um, he um, currently serves as a member of President Trump's Economic Recovery Task Force. Uh, he is on a leave of absence from the Heritage Foundation, where he is a distinguished visiting fellow and works on the Project for Economic Growth. He was for many years a regular columnist and a member of the editorial board at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he's the founder and, former, and a former president of the Club for Growth, and he also founded the Free Enterprise Fund. As I'm going through his bio, I think you can see a theme emerging uh, with him. He previously served as a senior economist for the Congressional Joint Economic Committee, as a senior economics fellow at the Cato Institute, and as a senior economics analyst at CNN. And we, we won't hold that last one uh, against you. Uh, during the 2016 presidential campaign, he served as a senior economic advisor to then-candidate Donald Trump and helped draft the Trump tax plan. He's the co-author with Art Laffer, who some of you have surely heard of, Art Laffer, of a book titled Trumponomics, Inside the, uh, Inside the America First Plan to Get Our Economy Back on Track. Uh, he's spoken for us a number of times over the years, uh, including at this event, the Free Market Forum, and uh, we're delighted he's able to be with us again. Uh, Steve Moore. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm such a huge, huge fan of Hillsdale College, and uh, it is just, um, at least we have one school in America that teaches um, free markets, and so uh, it is just uh, really a thrill for me to, uh, to, uh, to be um, here with you all tonight. I think one of the most things I've ever, um, that, that I've written in my life, the, the most read thing and I'm not exaggerating, was like eight years ago, I had a piece in an imprimatur, and I, I don't know, I, it was like two million people read it. So I, I love that publication, and, and congratulations on that. Um, I want to talk a little bit tonight about, uh, about what is going on with our political system and our, in this uh, amazing election, and kind of tie it back to economics. And let me start by saying that uh, I was privileged in 2000 16 to uh, work for Donald J. Trump, and um, I didn't. I, I tell the story in our book about Trumponomics that when I first, uh, when Trump first called Larry Kudlow. By the way, how cool is that Larry Kudlow is the most important economist in the country today? I mean, Larry's just such a superstar, uh, and he, he's my best friend, and he was my best man in my wedding. So we worked side by side. We got the call from Trump to to go see him. This was uh, about you know about five years ago. Went to Trump Tower and 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 uh, and met Trump and and, and I always t I tell the story in my book. At the time, I had a very negative impression of Donald Trump. I didn't I didn't like his persona. I thought he was kind of a, an egomaniac. Sometimes he still is, <laughs> but you know I I, I thought. You know, he's, this is just a publicity stunt that he's running for president. Anyway, we went in and we met with Trump for a, a good hour, and I was just dazzled by the guy. Uh, how many of you met Donald Trump in person? I think a lot of you have. I mean, he's just an amazing, he has that uh, X factor that just, you know, lights up a room. And, you know, I've always said there's, uh, you know, three prior people I've met in politics that have that, you know, incredible um, ability to connect with the American people. Uh, Ronald Reagan, of course, uh, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama. And, you know, as, as great a, I would say that as great a, um, uh, a, a politician um, as, as Ronald Reagan was, that even he couldn't hand a, uh, hold a candle to Bill Clinton because uh, Bill Clinton could literally and figuratively charm your pants off. But, um, but um, <laughs> You know, but Trump does have that. You know, he's amazingly charming, and he's 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 someone that I've come to really um, respect and and admire. And he has turned out to be as president. Wouldn't you agree? Much more conservative than I even thought he would be. You know, he's been amazing. He's been he is. I mean, he really has. He's one of the rare things about. Think about this with Donald Trump. One of the rare things about him is he has done exactly what he said he would do. Right? What, wow. What a, what a, when I was at, you're right, I, I, for, as penance for serving for Donald Trump, I had to go to CNN for two years, you know, and that was, you know, that was brutal. Uh, and it, it was the Hate Trump Network. And uh, anyway, you know, I would be on, it would be six against one, and they just beat up on Trump relentlessly. And, you know, every time he would do something, you know, like pull out of the, uh, you know, the Paris Climate Accord, which, by the way, is that one of the great things that Donald Trump did, is pull America out of the anti, 
America uh, Paris Climate Accord, these, these liberals would come up to me, they'd be puzzled, and they'd go, why is Donald Trump doing this? And I said, because he said he was going to do it, right? I mean, he does what he said he's going to do. And so uh, anyway, he, he's been an amazing. I think he's been a, a great president with respect to what he's done for our economy. And uh, I, I wanna, one of the mes messages I want to leave with you tonight is this is a totally competitive race. I've lived this through this before. Four years ago, exactly this time, every single political pundit, every single pollster in America said that Donald Trump has a five to 10% chance of winning. Remember that? A five to 10% chance of winning. Um, and, uh, and so they were wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, and we're gonna see that again. I think this is a total, um, uh, to, uh, jump ball race right now. I really do. I think it go go any either way in the next four weeks, and uh, we have to work work hard. Uh, if if you're somebody for Trump, we have to work hard to make sure that um, he does win. But I've told this story before. I think I told it the last Hillsdale event I was at. But I think it's it's really indicative of why you cannot trust these polls. They're just completely untrustworthy. And I I was in Florida about two weeks before the election uh, in 2016, and I was not feeling great about things at that time because that, remember that Bush, that tape had come, come out about Trump where he'd said some lewd things about women, and I thought, gee, this is, the, this is the end for Trump, and we had been making all this progress, and then this tape comes out, and I thought, oh my gosh, we can't overcome this. And I remember I was feeling really low, and, and I was walking down the street, and I saw a bumper sticker on a car. And sometimes in life, a bumper sticker can tell you more about what's going on in society than any 600, you know, uh, word, essay or a 600 page book and what this bumper sticker said I'll never forget it it said vote for Donald Trump nobody has to know <laughs> and I thought wow that's 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 the answer that's why I won and what I'm here to tell you about is there are millions there are millions of un what I call undercover Trump voters out there. We all know them. There are people who would never tell a pollster that they were going to vote for Donald Trump. They would never tell their friends they're going to vote for Donald Trump. We know. We know that from 2016. And what these voters did was they went into the voters' booth. They may have even told pollsters they were going to vote for Hillary Clinton, and they pulled the lever for Trump. And I think that's going to happen again. And so, um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident. Now, what I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Tonight is, is what we've gone through in the last nine months and what lessons we've learned. This is, uh, this is a uh, seminar about free market economics. So what have we learned about, in terms of the governmental interventions in the face of this pandemic? So let, I'll just start with the headline of what I have to say. And I think you're going to hear more of this tomorrow. I think you have an amazing panel on, on, uh, on uh, the pandemic. But my kind of headline is very simple. I believe, I wonder how many of you uh, agree with me on this, that the lockdown of the American economy was one of the greatest mistakes the United States have ever made. And it's not even close. This has been, um, it has had catastrophically negative consequences, uh, not just for the economy, which are pretty obvious, but also the health of the American people. And I would argue that it's not even close, that the costs of these lockdowns have been orders of magnitude larger than, the, um, than, than any benefits. And so, we realized right from the start that, that uh, this was going to, that, that government was going to seize power in unprecedented ways when this past pandemic uh, hit these shores back in March of 2020, when we started to really see some people get um, cases of, of corona and so on. And it was pretty clear that, that there had to be a, uh, somebody pushing back on this. And so we, uh, we started a group with, uh, with people like Art Laffer and a bunch of great economists like Steve Forbes and others to try to push back on this and say, let's, let's be rational. And by the way, this was even before we knew what we've learned over the last nine months. One of my frustrations is we're still doing stupid things nine months later. I mean, did you see New York today actually imposed more lockdowns? more lockdowns on their economy. So there hasn't been a learning curve. But our line from the very start is that we have to keep the economy open because you can't have a society without a functioning economy, but we have to do it in a safe and secure uh, way. And so we started looking at what the governors were doing. And by the way, I think, I think Trump's narrative, uh, and, and even Mike Pence, by the way, wasn't Mike Pence an incredibly marvelous last night? I mean, he just did an amazing job. But I, I think that, the, that Trump and Pence don't have the narrative right about what's going on with respect to, to coronavirus. Trump did something that we all as people who believe in our constitution and federalism um, and sound economics really 
um, support, and the left does not support this, which is one of the first decisions we told Trump would be a very wise thing to do, is look, we're 50 states. Let the states deal with this. Nebraska, by the way, this is a great, great state. The great state of Nebraska is not New York. Right? Nebraska doesn't have to have the same kinds of, uh, you know, health codes that, uh, that uh, New York City does. I mean, it's just stupid. And by the way, that's why this idea of the left that, that Joe Biden keeps talking about, about we have to have all these national policies, that's just wrong. We need to let states determine how to handle this. And we did. And I think that was one of the smartest things Trump did. And as a consequence, what we saw, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but what we've seen very clearly is that for the most part, not entirely, Republican governors have handled this in, in a very, very effective way, and Democratic governors have, have handled it in an incredibly ineffective way. Uh, and so the first thing we did was we, we put out a report card about how the governors were doing in terms of handling the crisis uh, in a way that would keep their economies rolling, would, would not just flatten their businesses and their workers, but it would also keep their, their, uh, you know, their, their people safe from, from this terrible, deadly disease. And by the way, I have two good friends uh, who've died from coronavirus, so I'm not minimizing the lethality of this terrible, terrible uh, pandemic. But what we saw is that the states almost immediately got um, adopted completely opposite strategies um, in terms of dealing with the crisis. And so you can see the red states, actually, uh, you know, the red and kind of uh, brown states, those are the states that, if, that put in, in place very, very strict and severe lockdowns. And you can see it was the, you know, obviously these are, these are the Democratic states, California, uh, Oregon, Washington, and then you can see the Northeast is, is all, all, you know, uh, very, very uh, red in terms of red meaning stop, stopping economic activity. And then you can see the green states, the, the, the ones in the middle and the ones in the south, those are states that did not have overly bearing um, uh, overly bearing uh, restrictions on economic activity. Okay, so that's point number one. Uh, let me show you the next chart. So we then we go, these are the grades of the governors. And by the way, uh, I know, how many people here are from Colorado? I, I know that uh, there are some people that I know, I met three or four people. You've got a pretty good governor. In fact, uh, not every, uh, your governor, Jared Polis, was the one Democratic governor that we gave an A to. He was he was not especially restrictive, and and I'd be, I'd say to this day that that Jared Polis has done a very fine job in terms of dealing uh, with this crisis in Colorado. But then you see all the other states are basically um, Republican states. How many Floridians are here? Any Floridians? I see one or two. Ron DeSantis has emerged as one of the great superstars, and and, and I mean Ron DeSantis has just been amazing, uh, and he's 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 done an incredible job dealing with the crisis. And then you know the Georgia governor, I don't know if there are any uh, Georgians in the room, and uh, the Iowa governor has been fantastic. Nebraska, your governor here in Nebraska has been outstanding, uh, and uh, Oklahoma has had a great governor. Um, South Dakota, I think you had. Did you say you had an event with? Uh, Christine Ohm, who's another rising superstar. Um, she's done an amazing job. Tennessee, Wyoming, these are the states that did the best work, um, you know, work. And then you see the ones at the bottom. Uh, these are states like uh, Virginia, where I live, and states like, um, well, you know, it's basically the ones you would expect. Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, and so on, did, a, did an abysmal job. They basically just flattened all their businesses and destroyed their, their cities. By the way, if you have any of you been to, it's, it's tragic, because I'm, I'm one who loves American cities. I mean, I'm, I just think, you know, our gems are the great, great cities of America. I'm from Chicago. I think Chicago is one of the great world-class cities in the world. And it, it, it is so saddening to me how inept liberal leadership has destroyed these cities. You know, they've been hit twice now. They've been hit with the coronavirus, and then they got hit with these riots and incompetent leadership that, that allowed you know, rioters and criminals to burn down their immigrant businesses. And, and, and the people who've been suffering the most from that, by the way, are the lowest income people. It's really disgraceful what's happened. By the way, anybody here from New Jersey? I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, New Jersey has the worst um, governor in America in Murphy, and he's been cat catastrophic. And, and so now you, you, let's look at the, re the actual record of what happened. So these are uh, a little bit of out of date, but not out of date, but not much. These are the death rates uh, of the major states. Uh, you know, so let's just look at how they did. Did they? How did they handle the crisis? And this is deaths per 100,000 people. And you can see here that, <laughs> look at where the deaths are. New York, New Jersey, 
Um, and, by the way, I don't have Massachusetts on here, but Massachusetts had a very, very high death rate. Rhode Island had a very, very high death rate. Illinois had a pretty high uh, death rate. Connecticut had a high death rate. Uh, these are states that had the strictest lockdown, and yet they had the, they had the most deaths. So look, I'm not a health expert. I don't, I don't have any expertise in health whatsoever, but I am an economist. I can look at data. And when you look at this, you say, wait a minute, the states that had the strictest lockdowns also had the highest death rates. Then you look at the states like Arizona, Georgia, Florida. Now, by the way, these death rates have gone up a bit uh, in those states because the virus you know, in, in the late summer went through these states. It's basically through Florida now, it's through Georgia, it's through uh, Arizona. So their death rates are now you know, in the 50s or so. So it's not quite as imbalanced as it was. But the fact is that these states did not lock down. They did have a wave of coronavirus go through, but they were not devastated like these, uh, like these um, uh, blue states were. So then the next question is, what have we done in response to uh, coronavirus? What has been the, uh, the federal response? And this is something as a one who believes in limited government and, and free enterprise um, is very disturbing to me. We have massively spent money on these programs and it has been highly, highly questionable about how effective these have, things have been. So we've had four or five rounds of federal spending, they call these, um, the, uh, you know, these uh, stimulus bills. And by the way, I think everyone in this room knows something that almost nobody in Washington seems to understand. Government spending doesn't stimulate anything, right? Government spending does not stimulate anything except government. Uh, and this is the, all you're doing is taking money from one person and taking and giving it to another. It's not like there's some kind of magic money in Washington that, that is, uh, that is uh, you know, adding to the GDP. And so what we've done is we've already spent about $2.3 trillion. That's a lot of money, by the way, $2.3 trillion? Think about that. I mean, I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal, some of you were, uh, saw it and were mentioning it, and I just did a thought experiment. I said, because right now, as we speak, there's negotiations between the White House and Nancy Pelosi about another round of stimulus, you know, that's been held up for the last couple of months, and Pelosi wants Two, well, originally she wanted $3.2 trillion. Now she wants $2.2 trillion. And the White House is at $1.5 trillion. And I think that at some point they may you know, make, a, make a deal. I hope they don't. I, we don't need another stimulus bill. It's not going to help the economy. But here's something to think about. For $2.2 trillion, we could completely eliminate the personal and corporate income tax for an entire year. That means no business, no American worker out of 150 million workers would have to pay any income tax for a year. Now, this isn't too complicated, is it? Is it? I mean, what would be better for the American economy? For the federal government to collect $2 trillion and then go out and spend it on all these giveaways, bailouts to the, uh, the transit systems and bailouts to the airlines and bailouts to this thing and money for the arts and money for the blue states and all of this stuff? Or would it be better for the economy to just cancel? Think of what the, econ the economy would explode in 2021 if there was no income tax on American businesses or, or workers. I mean, it would explode. It would be the biggest stimulus in the history of civilization. And instead of that, they want to spend money. And, and even a lot of the Republicans want to do that. So that gives you a sense of how foolish this is. Government spending is not going to get us out of this crisis. There's only one thing that can get the economy moving, and that is to get the states to open up their economies. It's that simple. If you've got businesses that are flattened, and you've got people that can't go back go to work because the government won't allow them to do it, and if you've got governments shutting down stores and restaurants and churches and all of these things, it doesn't matter how much government money you put into the system, it is not going to rescue the economy. So I've been like one voice, and we, there's many, many, many who keep saying over and over again, just if you want to get the economy healthy, there is no substitute for, uh, for, um, you know, for opening up the businesses and allowing them to, uh, to grow. Now, this just gives you a sense of the foolishness of what we've done this year. This is showing total government spending uh, this year, we start with, you know, every year state and local governments spend about $2 trillion. Then we added $1.5 trillion through the first couple of rounds of stimulus. Now Pelosi wants another $3 trillion. Now she's saying two, but originally she wanted three. Then we started the year with $4.7 trillion of government spending even before coronavirus hit. You add all that up, we're talking about 10 to $11 trillion of government spending. 
The only people who have benefited from, the only sector of the economy that has benefited from this coronavirus has been government. That's the only sector that's been growing. And what is wrong with that picture? Now, let me show you the next one. This shows you GDP. This, this should frighten everyone in this room. I showed this very chart to the president, by the way, two weeks ago. I was in the Oval Office with the president, and I showed him this, and he was aghast at this. I mean, if we were to, now this, we were talking about when she was talking about th uh, three trillion, but even, even if it's two trillion dollars, we're going to, the, for the first time in American history, have total government spending over 50% of our GDP. America, the land of the free, 50%, even at the height of World War II, when we were fighting the Nazis and the Japanese, government spending only rose to a high of about 45% of GDP at the height of World War II. Throughout our history, you know, gov federal uh, total government spending has been about 15 or 20% of GDP. We're going to go to 51%. I mean, that's beyond Bernie Sanders' wildest dreams, right? And he's an avowed socialist. So, you know, I was saying, Mr. President, we can't allow that to happen on your watch. Do not allow another massive government spending. And that, that just shows you the chart. You know, look what just straight up in terms of government spending in 2020, especially if we allow that, that uh, next bill to go through. And here's just showing the components of government. I mean, government would be the biggest industry in America. It would be bigger than, uh, you know, private investment. And it just shows you all the other components of our economy, they dwarf uh, in comparisons with, uh, with government. Um, same thing with, uh, here's another thing. Look at, this is the change in employment in the United States. Uh, virtually every industry obviously has lost jobs. Right? I mean, and you can see, obviously, the leisure industry has gotten really hammered, but almost every industry has lost jobs. There's a few exceptions. The technology sector has done well. But the one major sector that has not laid off people is the government. <laughs> you know, the government is hiring more and more people, while the private sector is laying off people, which is, uh, which is why one of the things I strongly object to, and I pray, when I say my prayers at night, I pray that Donald Trump does not make a deal with Pelosi. The reason that this whole stimulus bill has been held up right now is Nancy Pelosi wants $500 billion for blue states for blue states, for Illinois, for California, for New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. And that is not something that we can accept. Why, why should people in states like Texas and Tennessee and Utah and Idaho and Nebraska uh, and, uh, and states like Georgia and South Carolina have to pay more taxes to bail out the blue states? The blue states have acted incompetently. And one of the points I made to the president when I saw him two weeks ago, I said, Mr. President, there's a term in psychology called enabling, enabling. If we bail out the blue states, what we're doing is enabling them to keep their government, their private sector shut down. We're enabling Cuomo to make the stupid decisions he's making week after week. It's less likely that Cuomo is going to open up his economy if we give them money, not more likely. So I, I urged him not to do that. We'll see what, what, what happens. Um, that's kind of the same thing. Um, this just shows you that, uh, you know, the, the big layoffs have been in the private sector. If you were, you're basically twice as likely to have been laid off if you're a private sector worker than a government worker. Um, that's not fair. Uh, and then I want to just make a couple of other points. So if you, if you look at the unemployment rates of the states, because I just did a, a document, uh, a documentary for pra PragerU. How many of you watch PragerU videos? Those are fantastic, and I had a great time working with those folks. And Dennis Prager produces those. You go out to California, and if you haven't seen it yet, it's, it's only been up for like two days and already has 2.5 million views, so it's gone viral. And it's basically blue state versus red state America. And this is something, this has been one of my themes. I'm writing a book about this now, that America, we are two countries right now. You know, the first line of my thing is, we are not right now the United States of America. We are not, we are not united. We're just not. I wish we were, but we're not. We are, uh, we are a divided states of America today. You have red state America that is doing one thing, and blue state America that's gone way over to the left, and, and there's not a lot of in between right now. And so you have true, two completely different models in play right now. Uh, red states have lower taxes. Lo red states have less regulation. Red states have our, our, our um, are states that uh, have uh, uh, um, right to work laws. They don't compel people to join a union. We're all in favor of unions. I don't have a problem with unions. I don't have a problem with private sector unions. I do have a problem with the government compelling people to join a union. And so uh, you, have, you see a big divide between what the red states are doing and the blue states. And uh, 
it makes a big difference. The blue states are melting down right now. That's the big story of America. This is what I want Trump to say. America doesn't have a coronavirus crisis right now. The blue states do. America doesn't have an unemployment rate store, uh, problem right now. You know, you have 12 red states today, including Nebraska and Iowa and Utah and Georgia and a lot of these other states that, that have unemployment rates of less than 6%. Even having gone through a nine-month crisis with coronavirus, these states are basically close to full employment. You've got uh, 10 states right now that have unemployment rates over 10%. And guess what? Nine out of the 10 are blue states run by Democratic governors. Um, and that tells you a lot. Not only did they kill more of their own people, but they also put, you know, uh, flatten their economies. And, and that's, a re I think, a really important message. Now, when I show this to my, some of my liberal friends, I say, look, you look at, one of my favorite things to do is just compare the four biggest states in the United States, right? The four biggest states are Texas, Florida, New York, and, uh, and uh, California, right? And as this is a kind of perfect experiment because two of those states are, are very red states, uh, Florida and Texas, and two of them are very blue states, New York and California. And so then you look at the results and you say, okay, what's happening in those states? Well, guess what? Over the last 10 years, one million people have moved into Florida on net. That is, one million more people moved into Florida than moved out of Florida, and 1.2 million more people moved into Texas than moved out of Texas. Meanwhile, you look at these blue states, New York lost 1.3 million people in 10 years on net, 1.3 million people. California, by the way, how the hell do you screw up California, right? I mean, it's, it's like paradise. I mean, it's beautiful mountains, beautiful beaches, beautiful weather, beautiful women. I mean, what's not to like about California? For the first time in American history, there's an outflow of people from California. Did you know that? People are leaving California. They lost a million people on that. The 2020, after the 2020 census, for the first time in American history, California may actually lose a congressional seat. That's what's happening. People are leaving. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing, right? People are leaving these. And, and by the way, I actually don't say that. I mean, I love California. By the way, I did a, do you all know who Paul Krugman is? By the way, he writes, uh, you know, for the New York Times. He's probably one of the most influential economists in the country, certainly on the left. I mean, he, what he says is Bible to them. And I did a debate with Krugman about um, uh, two years ago on the subject of red state, blue state. And I said, look, Paul, you gotta explain this to me. All these blue states like New York and Connecticut and New Jersey and, and California, they do, and Illinois, by the way, Illinois is a separate you know, case. I mean, it's just, an, a, does anybody hear from Illinois? Any Illinois? I mean, it is, I'm sorry, I mean, Illinois is just a disaster right now. And I, I love Illinois, but the, the incompetent leadership has really done so, so much damage. But I said to Krugman, I said, look, Paul, you have to explain this to me. I know, you know, I, know I have a small brain compared to yours, and I know you've got a have Nobel Prize, but I, and I, I said, I don't understand something. You know, you keep saying it's a great thing if we raise taxes, if we, by the way, what, do you all know, what is the income tax rate in Florida today? Zero, there is no income tax in Florida. What is the income tax rate in Texas? Zero. How in the world is, uh, is Joe Biden gonna create seven million jobs by raising every single tax rate in the United States? I mean, really, how, how is that at all possible? He's gonna raise taxes by $4 trillion and he's gonna create five million jobs? How, how is he gonna do that? I mean, and clearly, you know, when you look at the states, tax rates have a big, you know, big uh, influence. So anyway, I asked Krugman, how is this, why, what explains this migration out of these northeastern states to the, to the southern states? And Krugman said, well, Steve, you do have a pin-sized brain. You just don't understand this. He said, people are moving out of the blue states to the red states because of the weather. Because of the weather. And, you know, I, I didn't really like to have to do this, but I, I hit him pretty hard. And it was below the belt. But I said, I got up and I said, well, you know, uh, you know, Professor Krugman, and you are a very smart guy, and you know, I'm not nearly as smart as you are, and I kind of scratched my head and said, and I, you know, I, just, I just don't really understand something. I mean, I said, if all of this migration is due to the weather, why are people backing up, packing up their bags and leaving San Diego for Houston? And of course, he didn't have a much, of a, much of a response to that. Nobody leaves San Diego for the weather, right? And so anyway, this is an important th point that we have to make over and over again. Their model has already been tried. We've tried the Joe Biden model. And you look at New York City, and you look at Chicago, and you look at the ruin of these states, and we can't uh, allow that to happen. Uh, this is just showing, you know, uh, you know, economics is so simple. 
It, economics is all about incentives. That's really all it is all about. That's what Arthur Laffer teaches us. If you tax something, you get less of it, right? If you tax something less, you get more of it. This isn't complicated. Why do we tax people for smoking? Because we want people to smoke less. Uh, and so, uh, so the, the proposals out here are to, um, we, we had a proposal to, uh, to uh, suspend the payroll tax. We just said, okay, you want to help middle class people? Just stop paying, you know, let's have, stop paying the payroll tax for six months. And Trump loved the idea. And they wouldn't do that. They would not uh, suspend the payroll tax. What the Democrats wanted to do was extend unemployment benefits. Now, this is a classic example of stupidity in economics that becomes policy. So Nancy Pelosi insisted in that bill that passed that HEROES Act back in, um, Back, we passed that back, I think, in May, for $600 a week bonus unemployment benefits to unemployed workers, $600 a week. Now, most of you probably know this because it's been written up uh, quite extensively, that at $600 a week, not, by the way, not $600 a week benefits, $600 a week benefits on top of the normal benefits that people got. And so it turns out that for about 75% of workers, we were actually paying them more money to stay unemployed than to go back on the job. Now, that's pretty dumb, right? I mean, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. And so as the economy opened up, guess what? It was the bizarrest thing. We had 30 million unemployed people, but we had 7 million job openings. People wouldn't go back on the jobs. Why? Why wouldn't they go back on the jobs? Because they were being paid not to go back on the job. By the way, as soon as we cut those benefits, guess what? People actually did go back on the job. And, and that is you know, showing you that, uh, that the ne negative effect of these unemployment benefits would be sort of catastrophic. So, I'm going to, uh, I'd actually like to take some questions from you all. I, I think this is going to be a very tight election. I think Trump is, is going to win because of the undercover voters that are not being counted in these polls. I think it is highly consequential election. I think this is, um, this is a total conflict of visions between left and right. And one of the things, and I'll just sort of stop by saying this, one of the things that really bothers me is this idea that somehow, th th look, let me put it differently. This is not a contest between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. This is a contest between Donald Trump and the hardcore left in America. And they will, t if they take over, it will be, in my opinion, catastrophic for our country. We cannot allow this to happen. And by the way, it's it, one way of thinking about this, this is a race between Donald Trump and the media, right? This is a, the, the media. Have you ever seen anything like this before in your life? The treatment of this president? I mean, it, it, is, it is so disastrous uh, and so unfair the way this president has been treated. I mean, don't you agree with that? I mean, it's just a disgrace. And so uh, and Trump just plows through it. Uh, and he will win. And I think, you know, if, we, if he wins, and I think he will, I do think we're gonna see the greatest economy ever. I'll just leave you with a couple statistics. We had a Census Bureau report. I'm very proud of this because I helped put the, the tax plan together that, that, uh, that Biden wants to uh, repeal. We put that tax plan together. We put together the, uh, the deregulation efforts. Trump basically let the oil and gas you know, industry boom. By the way, did you know for the first time in 60 years under Donald Trump, the United States for the first time in most of our lifetimes is now producing more oil and gas than we're consuming? We are a net exporter of oil and gas. We're the number one producer of oil and gas in the world today. Uh, so those are amazing, amazing accomplishments. And I'm sick and tired of the media saying, oh, well, the only people who have benefited from Donald Trump's policies are the rich, right? That was what Kamal Harris said last night. Only the rich benefited from Donald Trump's policies. That's nonsense. So let me give you some of these statistics. The Census Bureau just came out with, the Census Bureau is the gold standard of economic data for the United States. And what they found was that for 2019, so this was right before the corona crisis because their data is delayed about six months, they found that um, in 2019, the poverty rate in the United States of America fell to its lowest level ever in the history of the United States. I mean, think about that. I mean, and not only that, but it fell to its lowest level for blacks, Hispanics, uh, Asians, women, uh, LGBTQ. I mean, any group you want to talk about, that rate fell to an all-time low. Um, that's incredible, uh, the lowest rate of poverty ever. Here's another one. Median household income. 
I'm not talking about Bill Gates. I'm not talking about Warren Buffett. I'm not talking about Warren, you know, uh, LeBron James. I'm talking about the average middle class family in the United States. Their incomes in three years went up $6,400. That's huge. Under Barack Obama in eight years, median income only went up $2,000. So think about that. In, in three years, under the pro-free market policies of Trump, middle incomes went up three times faster than they did under Barack Obama in eight years. And I would submit, by the way, you would think the fact that we had the all-time high in incomes and the all-time low in poverty rates, wouldn't you think that would be like a blazing headline in every newspaper in America? I mean, that's a pretty, pretty exciting stuff, right? That we've, made, we've you know, reduced poverty, we've had huge increases in income. I couldn't find it in any of the newspapers. And I would submit to you, if you, to you, if that had happened under Barack Obama, it would have been a headline like you've never seen before, right? I mean, that gives you a sense of what we're up against in terms of the media. Finally, just to end on one other point, we are now, how many of you watched the debate last night? How many of you watched that? Most of you did. I mean, the, the, these moderators are just driving me crazy, right? I mean, the moderators have been so skewed against Trump. And they keep asking these loaded questions that are like left-wing talking points. So one of the points that Susan, uh, what's her name, Susan Page made yesterday was she said, uh, Vice President Pence, you know, the economy's slowing down and, you know, we're, we're, it's, not, it's not working anymore and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, what the hell is she talking about? We have created 11 million jobs in five months. 11 million jobs in five months. The unemployment rate has fallen to 7.9%. Every single economic projection uh, by the Congressional Budget Office, the Federal Reserve Bank, every independent economist at on Wall Street said that we are out of 12 or 13% unemployment now. That's what they said six months ago. We're down to 8%. That's incredible, okay, having gone through this incredible pandemic. Uh, we, we have seen, here's, here's one other statistic, which is what I call the October surprise, because this number isn't going to officially come out for another week or two, but it is coming out, and I may be wrong by a couple of percentage points, but I track this stuff very carefully. So the GDP for the third quarter, which just ended on September 30th, you all sitting down? You know, so this is an amazing number. The GDP for the third quarter of the United States of America will be up 32%. 32%. That, by the way, the old record, usually like a 3 or 4% increase in GDP in over a quarter is a really good number, 33%. We've never seen anything like that in the history of the country. This economy is not slowing down. It is coming back big time. The only thing that can prevent it from coming back, and I wonder, I'm not a conspiratorialist, but I wonder if these blue states are keeping their economy shut down precisely so that the numbers don't look good for Trump. Maybe I'm just a conspiratorialist. But anyway, um, thank God we have people... Um, you know, great, great institutions like Hillsdale College. You guys do an amazing job teaching our kids, and, uh, and I just wish every child in America could go to Hillsdale. Thank you very much. It's been a great, great pleasure. Um, I'd be happy to, if we have some time, I'm happy to take a, a few questions. I'd love to hear kind of what's on your mind. Do we have a few minutes? Or? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moore. We now have some time for Q&A. Okay, so sure. Please raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone to you. Hi. Hi. Good evening. My name is Carlson, and uh, I was just wondering if you could make a comment about uh, our relationship with China under the Trump administration and how it would look different if we had a, a Vice President Biden. So this is a really important question um, because I'm being fully serious with you. Um, who do you think are the who do you think benefits the most in the whole world? Who will benefit the most if Joe Biden is president? Well, I'll name three people who benefit. Vladimir Putin, President Xi in China, and the Saudi uh, oil sheiks. They will benefit greatly if, if uh, Biden becomes president. Um, they are rooting for him. And in fact, you see a lot of Ch Chinese money. You know, they talked about Russian money coming in you know, for Trump. What's happening right now, Chinese money is just del deluging into the United States behind Biden. They, do you think China, Beijing, do you think President Xi wants to deal with another four years with Trump? Hell no, he doesn't. This is a president. Uh, and by the way, when I first met Trump, I disagreed with him on China. 
You know, I don't always agree with, one of the things I admire about Trump is you can disagree with the guy. He loves to argue, actually. And he makes, he's a great executive. He makes the decision. We, we slug it out a lot of times. He likes that. Uh, but, you know, I, I said, you know, Donald, I'm a free trade guy and blah, blah, blah. And, and he's actually changed my opinion. I'm still for free trade. I'm a Milton Friedman guy. But you can't have free trade with a country that's predatory. They have predatory trade practices. What is happening in China right now is extraordinarily dangerous. It's ex this is, China, in my opinion, is, is Japan circa 1939. That's how dangerous the situation is with China. They're building up their military. They are, I, I'd hate to be Hong Kong or Taiwan right now. They're, they've already marched into and taking land out of, from India. This is a scary situation. And Trump, is, to his great, great credit, is the first president who said, China is not a friend, they are not an ally, they are an adversary and an enemy. How many of you agree with that? They are not a friendly power today. And I just shudder to think, you know, and, and you, know, you know this, I mean, when it comes to China, Joe Biden is a patsy. He's a patsy. And, uh, and so it's a great point. I thought I would never say this, and I'm not trying to scare people in this room, but, I, but I, you can tell I feel passionately about this election. I, I do believe that if Joe Biden is elected president and these left-wing policies like $4 trillion tax increases and dismantling our, uh, you know, our, our energy industries, and I mean, look, folks, we have a $20 trillion economy. Is there anybody in their right mind who thinks we can power a $20 trillion economy that produces cars and steel and technology and food and all this stuff? You can do that with windmills? I mean, how stupid is that, really? It's, it's the stupidest, and by the way, you know, Mike Pence was right last night. The, does, do you all know what country in the world has reduced its carbon emissions more than any other country? We have. We have. We're not the villain. China is. You want to talk about the country? They're, they're building 100 coal plants as we speak. Every time we shut down a coal plant in the United States, China builds 10 of them. How is that reducing carbon emissions? So it's a great point, and I think that uh, we, that's another reason why, uh, why Trump uh, needs to win. I think, sir, you had a question. Dave Bagley from Omaha. I want to thank you, Steve, for an exceptional talk this evening. Um, my question is, could you give us a little more color or insight with regard to your private meeting with the president two weeks ago? Well, I'll, I'll tell you coming find some fun stories about Donald Trump, because he, first of all, Donald Trump is, a, is truly a freak of nature. I mean, the guy does not sleep. I'm serious. I mean, he is the hardest working person I've ever met in my life. I mean, some of you may know him personally. I mean, every time, I mean, when I was working on the campaign with him four years ago, it'd be like two o'clock in the morning, the phone rings, is, is, and you know, my wife would ask the phone, and she'd hand it over to me, and I'd say, uh, you know, she'd say, uh, Steve, it's, it's Donald Trump. What are you doing? I'm like, what am I doing? What is that? It's two o'clock in the morning. What do you think I'm doing? I mean, the guy just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And, uh, you know, he's, he's an amazing, um, he's, he's an amazingly good person. It's just personally, he has been so good to me. Really, I mean, he is, he is a great friend to have. If you're in a fight, you want Donald Trump on your, on your side. You really do. He is, he is an amazingly loyal person to people who are loyal to him. Um, but, you know, there's just so many fun stories about him. By the way, you know, one of the, I talk about this in the book, when I first started working for him and I traveled with him, which was a lot of fun during the, you know, 2016 campaign, and we'd go like three or four cities in a day in a dizzying schedule, and it was just exhausting. But anyway, you'd never have, you'd go from one event to another to another to another, and you wouldn't have time to eat, right? Because you just run into the place, you do the event, and then you run back and get on the plane and fly somewhere else. So, you know, the, the, the only time you had to eat was when you're on the plane. And so I thought, this could be so cool. You know, uh, we, when, you, when, I, uh, when, when I first traveled, I said, this is going to be great. The guy's a billionaire. It's going to be caviar and lobster and champagne, you know, and, and we get on the plane. And every event we did, every lunch and dinner, we were exactly the same. It was McDonald's, Big Macs for lunch, and Domino's pizza for dinner. This is a man of the working class, right? And it's just really very, very uh, funny. Um, but, you know, one of my favorite stories about Trump, because I, I just was with him, um, I'm not gonna tell you some of the things he says behind closed doors, but I was at a dinner with him about, oh, about a month or so ago, and it was with, actually it was with a bunch of the governors. The Republican governors had been in, in, in town. And uh, it was, so he was giving a talk to, like there were about 30 people in the room, so it was a very casual thing. And he, but he was standing at a podium, and he was just kind of having a fun time, and, and he saw the, the governor who was right in front of him, like, you know, you're right in front of me, he was kind of sipping his wine. And so <laughs> Trump just said off, he said, um, hey, governor, he said, 
do you know I don't drink? By the way, how many of you knew that about Donald Trump that he didn't drink? I, I actually had been around him. It never occurred to me that I had never seen him drink. So he said to the governor, he said, uh, Governor, do you know I don't drink? And the governor kind of nodded his head and said, yes, Mr. President, I've heard that about you. And Trump's kind of paused and goes, Governor, can you imagine me if I drank? <laughs> I thought that was a really funny thing. He, he has a really self-effacing sense of humor. By the way, I wish he'd use that, right? I think one thing that is missing from these debates is humor. Reagan used humor so effectively. Uh, but, you know, my other, that same night, by the way, it was, he had a, there was a, a pastor who was there who said this opening prayer for the dinner. And then he took some questions from people, and the pastor asked him this question. And he said, uh, you know, uh, Mr. President, he said, uh, you know, when you sin, do you get down on your knees at night and ask the Lord for forgiveness? And I thought, that's an interesting question to ask Donald Trump. And so um, Trump, like, literally was, like, standing there for a minute, like, thinking about it. You know, like, most people said, of course, I ask for forgiveness. But Trump, <laughs> Trump thought about it for a minute. There's this awkward silence, and he goes, he goes, you know, I just can't think of anything that I'd have to ask the Lord for forgiveness for. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's very, he, can, he has a great sense of humor, and, and uh, he's a hard worker, and he works for us. You know, that's the thing about him. I mean, that's the other thing. This is not a hard choice, guys, right? We have guys who've been in politics for 45 years and done nothing with his life, and you've got a guy who's an accomplished businessman, right, who's done an incredible job as president. Have there been mistakes with coronavirus? There have. Yeah, he's made mistakes. I think Biden would have made, even made bigger mistakes. But, you know, how in the... The, the one reason, there's another reason I think Trump is going to win, is if you look at the polling, there's one, you know, there's one question that really stands out to me, and, and it's, I think, the reason Trump is going to win, and that's this question. Who do you think can handle, get the economy up and running again? That number Trump is win, is just creaming Biden, because people do understand. Trump does know what he's doing when it comes to the economy, and Biden doesn't have any idea what he's doing. So I think in the end of the day, a lot of those undecided voters say, because look, Trump's big problem is this, 56% of voters do not like Donald Trump. They do not like him. So he's gotta convince about 10% of these people who don't like him to vote for him anyway, which they did in 2016. I guess there's one over there. We're gonna take a question over here really quick. Oh, sure, where are you? Oh, there you are. Sorry. Hi. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for tonight. I am I'm unfortunately from California, but I'm a CPA. So I, I just have a really quick comment about the debate and the tax stuff last night followed up by a question. Um, when they were talking about the tax savings last night, I actually pulled data from my program and compared, found about 300 comparable entries. And what I found was uh, families and individuals who made approximately, on average, $6,000 more from 2017 to 2018 and paid about $1,200 less tax than, and so it's real, you know, these are just clients from my system. Um, but my question would be, um, I think one of the actual worst parts about Donald Trump's tax plan is the SALT deduction and specifically that it, it is equal for single and married couples, so it's a huge um, marriage penalty. Um, so I, I just wanted to hear your comments on that and if there was anything that you would change from the tax plan as it stands right now. Well, first of all, I, I, I hate to tell you this, but I was the single biggest proponent in the White House <clears throat> for, I was insistent upon this, that we include, that we get rid of the state and local tax deduction. Now, I know that some of you may live in blue states, but th all the state and local, you know, I remember I mentioned the word um, enabling. All the state and local uh, ta uh, tax deduction do is enable states like New York and Illinois <coughs> and New Jersey and California to have high taxes. And why should people in Texas have to pay more federal taxes to subsidize the fat and flabby government services in California. It just is, it isn't fair. And, and by the way, the reason, it's so interesting. It, this is an amazing thing that <clears throat> nobody in the press wants to focus on. There is a tax cut in, in, um, in, uh, in Nancy Pelosi's plan. There is a tax cut. You know what it is? She wants to bring, we, what we did is we limited it to $10,000. You could, you could deduct your state and local taxes up to uh, $10,000. And for 90% of American tax filers, you know, they, they, they don't go above the $10,000 level. So it only affects the top, you know, 10%. And the vast, vast, 60% of the benefits of getting rid of the state and local tax deduction go to the top 1%. And guess what two states those people live in? 
New York and California. And so, it's, and so that's the one tax cut that Pelosi has in her plan. And the irony is it would be the single biggest tax cut for rich people in the history uh, of the United States. What would I have done differently? I'm a Steve Forbes guy. Let's just have a flat tax of 18% and get rid of all the deductions and make it as simple as possible, right? I mean, wouldn't that be the best solution to our taxes? Get the rates down low. And this is what's really disturbing to me. You know, uh, to me, the essence of good tax, tax policy is the principle of having a broad base and low rates, right? You want, you want taxes not to be distortionary about uh, decisions. And by the way, in 1986, and that, which wasn't that so long ago, you had like, people like Bill Bradley and Dick Gephardt and Ted Kennedy, and everybody agreed, low rates, broad base. What, what the Biden plan is exactly the opposite. What Biden plan does is raise the rates, and he's including all of these new loopholes for people who run so, you know, solar energy firms and people who have windmills and people who do this and that and the other thing. And that's social policy through the tax system. So I'm a, I'm a flat, how many of you like the flat tax? Raise your hand. I mean, come on, that's what we need. All right, I, got, I think we have time for, I'm running out of gas. Maybe one or, one or two more quick ones and then we'll let you guys go. Hi, I'm Rich from Colorado. We have traveled over the Midwest in the last several weeks and see all kinds of Trump support in the rural America. And we're very appreciative of that. However, my concern is the ballot harvesting and all the other shenanigans that we have seen that may occur and probably will occur. And it's a matter, in my opinion, that after the November 3rd election, the Democrats will say, how many votes do we need to take over? And they will do whatever's necessary to make it happen. What's your concern? Uh, well, I have exactly the same concern. I mean, I, I believe that if this is a fairly held election, Donald Trump will win. But we saw this in 2018, sir. You know, we saw it especially in California. You know, I think the Republicans lost six congressional seats after the election when they said, oh, here's another bag of ballots. We didn't know. Oh, where did these come from? You know, and, and it, they just keep counting ballots until they, they uh, declared a bunch of their congressional candidates winners. So I'm very, very worried about that. And I'm not, I'm not an expert about, you know, ballot fraud, but I think it is, it is uh, the mail-in uh, balloting is going to be a big problem. But your point about, you know, what's so interesting about America, because I'm traveling a lot, um, you know, throughout the country, and you fly into the cities and you see about the Biden signs. And then it's almost like a linear relationship. The further away you get from the cities, it's Trump, 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 Trump. And, uh, you know, that, that's a really interesting phenomenon. I mean, I, I, when I, four years ago when I was in Ohio, I did an event about three weeks before the election for the campaign, and it was about 45 minutes out of, uh, out of um, Toledo, and we're driving towards Indiana, and uh, I'm, I'm looking out the window, because it's very, Ohio actually is a pretty rural state. It has a lot, a lot of beautiful, charming little towns. and, and uh, and I'm looking out the window, truly, all I, just like you said, sir, all I saw was Trump, 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 Trump. I mean, people would have these barns with these gigantic Trump signs on them and stuff. And I, I called Corey Lewandowski, the campaign manager, and said, Corey, this is amazing. I'm looking, I'm, I'm here in Ohio, I know this is a battle state. And I said, all I'm seeing is Trump signs. And it's literally, <clears throat> as soon as the words were out of my mouth, we go around a, a corner, and sure enough, there's one of those big blue Hillary signs. So I, I said, oh, you know, Corey, never mind, I just saw a Hillary sign. And my driver says to me, Joey says, hey, Steve, take a closer look at that sign. We get a little closer, it said, Hillary for prison. <laughs> so, but you know, there is, a, there is a real relationship between, you know, the, the divide is between urban and rural. Maybe one more and then we'll call it a night, if there is any more. Um, hi, sir. Hi, Peter Jacobson from the Gortney Institute. Uh, thank you for taking my question. About two decades ago, you published a book, It's Getting Better All the Time, with the late Julian Simon. Uh, I'm curious your take today, if the theme of optimism that's in that book, if you have that optimism today, and is that optimism contingent on this election, or is it more robust than that? Thank you. Wow, that, that's a tough question. You know, that, that's, because I've, I've been thinking a lot about that. And, you know, I was really proud of that book. We were talking at dinner. How many of you know who Julian Simon was? Raise, raise your hand. Julian Simon was the great one. He was my mentor. Uh, this is an important, I'm going to take a minute to answer this, because it's, it's an important point you made, and then we'll break this up. Julian Simon took on, for those of you who don't know who he was, he was a doomslayer. So remember in the 60s and 70s, it was all 
uh, the world is overpopulated, we're running out of oil, we're running out of gas, we're running out of food, we're, you know, we're, uh, the world's becoming more polluted, you know, all, that was the first of the climate change craziness and so on. And Julian Simon was the one scholar among, uh, among thousands, among thousands, who said, no, this is all wrong. We're not running out of food. We're not running out of oil. We're not running out of gas. We're not, you know, the environment is getting better, not worse in every way. And truly, people thought he was a lunatic. I mean, they wanted to, they said he should, they should take his PhD away from him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's taking on all the established scientists who were saying just the opposite. Well, guess what? It was Julian Simon who was completely vindicated in everything he said. I mean, nobody today believes we're running out of oil and gas, right? Nobody believes we're running out of food. Nobody believes that the world is overpopulated. None, none of those things actually happen. And the reason I wanted you all to think about this is that, you know, if, this, if he were alive today, they would shut him up. The, the left would shut him up and shut him down. They would muzzle him. They have, this is a frightening thing, what they're saying about science today. They have so politicized science. When the left says we have science on our side, what they mean is we find five scientists over here who agree with what we say. And so that's the science. And it's happening, it's even happened in, the, in, in how they're dealing with this disease. Now, they're actually asking the doctors, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And so on. And so I find that to be very, this isn't science when you shut up anyone who has a different opinion than you do about these things. It's not settled science. None of this stuff is, is really settled. And so uh, now your question about whether I'm still optimistic, yeah, I am. You know why? Because I think Reagan said it best. I mean, America really was, was put here as a beacon of freedom. And what worries me, now look, if Biden wins, it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be really bad. And I think most people have no idea how bad it's gonna to be to let these leftists take over the government. They're gonna, the deep state will, will be deeply ingrained and, and every dial, you know, again, economics isn't that complicated. What Trump did is he took the dials and he turn them to pro-growth, right? We'd reduce the regulations, reduce the taxes, we'd reduce, we got government off the back of business. And it was the private sector just exploded. So if you turn those dials back in the other direction, what happens? You get the opposite result, right? I mean, this isn't complicated, right? So if you start raising the taxes up again, you're gonna get the opposite result. So it will be a setback for this country. But you know, we've overcome this kind of thing before. So I, I do think, you know, I, I do think America's gonna prevail. The one thing I will say about this, the last thing I'll just say is, you know, my son, who's a millennial, and I'm always railing against the millennials. I just can't stand them. <laughs> and by the way, Trump has a big problem with the millennials. It's like 75% of millennials are for, for Biden. I've never seen a gap like this before. You know, 75% of millennials are for Biden and 25% are for Trump. And so they've they've they, they are an entitled generation, um, and they're snowflakes, right? And so I'm always railing against, because I have two sons that are uh, millennials, and I'm always railing against them. And, and finally, my son got really just sick of me complaining about his generation, and, and, he, and he said to me, Dad, just stop. He said, who do you think made us this way? <laughs> and you know, think about it, we're to blame. We are to blame, we did. We're the ones who gave everybody trophies for just showing up. You know, we're the ones who created a very entitled generation. And, uh, and so, you know, we are to blame. We're to blame for the schools. You know, who, think about somebody like AOC. AOC is a very smart woman. She's, very, she's a very bright woman. She's very articulate. She's bright. Where did she come up with these wacky ideas? I mean, all she's doing is regurgitating what she's been taught since kindergarten, right? This is what the public schools are doing. They're indoctrinating our kids. And if they don't go to Hillsdale College, they're being indoctrinated for another four years in college. We have got to do something about our education system in America. It has to change or America will not be America anymore. Thanks very much. It's great to be with you.